Today I thought we'd take a look at application response times and some basic ideas around using network traces to analyze response times. So I'm going to introduce a concept of request response pairs and of clients and services. We're going to look at some response time analysis terminology, just some common language that we can use to discuss this. I'm going to break down requests and responses into a number of elements and I can show you how we can uh, identify these in a trace. And then we're going to have a quick look at a database trace and apply some of these concepts. So the first thing to point out, and this is something I'm sure you know, we have interactions happening across the network, data flowing between two processes. We have a client process and a server process, uh, which I'll, I'll refer to intermittently as a service. And uh, they're connected together using a TCP connection, and the TCP connection goes through three phases. There's a connect phase, data transfer phase, and a disconnect. Most of what I'm going to talk about today is going to relate to the data transfer phase. An end-to-end -end system comprises of lots of clients and servers. So in this diagram here, we have Internet Explorer as a client to IIS, the Microsoft Web Server, providing a service. And then we have IIS acting as a client to a file server over here to pull things like static content, images, style sheets, etc. And then we have IIS acting as a client to a database server here to deliver um, dynamic content. Between the client and the service, we send a request from the client to the service. The service munches the request around, figures out what it should return, and then responds with the data. And the time difference between receiving the request and sending the response we'll call the service time. Over on this side, from the client's perspective, the time difference between sending the request and receiving the response, we'll call the response time. Now, aside from network delay, you wouldn't think that service time and response time are very different, but once we start looking at the packets that flow, we'll see that they are quite different. And in this case, this diagram I'm showing here is showing application messages and not packets. So we'll come on to the packets. But before the, we do that, I'd like to just talk very briefly about TCP acknowledgements. Um, you can get standalone acknowledgements. So we have a packet flowing with uh, a data length of zero. And I'm, I just wanted to point out that when we're looking at um, service time and response times, we're not necessarily interested in the acknowledgements that are going on certainly in the first instance. I'll come on to explain when we when we would look, but in the first instance, we're not so worried. And I've likened this to uh, you going into your favorite coffee shop. You go to the shop, you say, can I have a small cappuccino? The barista acknowledges that and says, sure. Then later, the barista delivers your coffee, and you may thank him for delivering the coffee. And the TCP equivalents are, are there on the right-hand side. We send the data, we get an acknowledgement, we, we get the response back from the service, and uh, we might acknowledge that response. So here's a trace that shows just that. We send a remote procedure call from a client to a Microsoft SQL Server. The Microsoft SQL Server acknowledges the receipt of that request, and then the server uh, responds with data, much along the lines of the co coffee shop scenario. So. Because we are only interested in the service time, we are not worried about the acknowledgements. So you can liken it to thinking if you were measuring the uh, doing some customer survey on the coffee shop, you're not so interested on how long it took the barista to acknowledge your order. You're more interested in sorry, you're more interested in how quickly the uh, the coffee arrives. And in just the same way, we're just interested in when did the the server receive our request and then when did it respond? That would measure the service. And in network terms, we can do this just by adding a very simple filter term. Um, TCP length is greater than zero and that will eliminate the standalone acknowledgements. So we just see the request followed by the response flowing in the other direction. So let's look at response time elements. We have client time, service time, 
request spread and response spread. Here's a, a system where we have a web server and a database. We send a request to the web server. The web server does some work, and I'll explain the client time term in a, in a second. Then the web server may want to insert a record into the database. Maybe the data uh, that has to uh, flow in that insert is larger than can be accommodated in one packet, and so we see four packets flow. Now, those four packets would generally flow uh, as quickly as possible, but there are some limiting factors. Bandwidth, load, or the effect of queuing on how quickly the packets traverse the network, TCP window size, latency values, all of those underlying transport mechanism uh, effects will have an effect on the time it takes to transfer the request to the database. And we call this request spread. Then the database will munch around the request and eventually the database will respond. Maybe the database responds with three packets. And in this case, we call this the response spread. And again, this is subject to all of the effects of the underlying transport mechanism, bandwidth, latency, etc. From a client perspective, as far as the client is concerned, it needs this whole operation to complete. There are a few exceptions to this. If you've ever looked at a trace of a web server, you send a request to the web server for a page, and the page data starts to flow in packets. As the uh, data is arriving at the web browser, the web browser starts to interpret the HTML immediately. And so you can see it going to get embedded objects even before all the data has been returned for the, uh, for the actual page. That is quite an exception, mostly for most applications, for databases, etc. The client needs the whole request to complete. So what's important as far as the client is concerned is the time from the first request packet to the last response. From a service perspective, what's important is last request to first response, because it's not until the last request has arrived that the database can start to process the request. And as soon as the database starts sending the data back, then the database function has completed. So once the data arrives back, we may have some more client time processing, so some more processing inside the web server before we can actually return uh, data to the into the browser. Uh, client time. So client time, when you're looking at this tier, the operation in this tier, the client time is the time between receiving a request into the web server and starting to send data and receiving a response back and, and then completing the operation here. So that's the client time from the perspective of this client. If this involved multiple database operations, then it would also include the time between each database operation. Uh, so that could be client time as well. So we've got client time. Most importantly, we've got service time. How long did the server actually take to do what we asked it to do? Then we've got the two spread values, which are affected by the transport mechanism. And then we've got, we've got the response spread down here, which is associated with sending two packets back to the browser. So those are the important elements. So let's actually have a look at a trace. So in this case, I have an access application that's actually making a query against a SQL database. So the trace has been taken with lots of other things going on. So we can see that we have uh, various things in here like SMB, and I think we've got some, yeah, we've got some uh, outlook to exchange traffic, et cetera. So let's apply a filter term. So this is the term I'm going to use. We're going to pick up just the stuff for the database. We're going to eliminate all of the uh, standalone acts, etc. But I do want to see SYN packets. We're going to eliminate retransmissions, and I'm not interested in keep alive activity. So let's grab that. And apply that to the trace. And immediately we're down to the point where we've got the, the database trace. And if we look here, we can see uh, some login, login activity against the database. Okay, so the thing that's really interesting to us probably is this thing here. So here 
Um, Wireshark hasn't managed to decode the request, but here we've got um, an actual SQL command. In fact, if you look down here, you can see it says select OPID, company, and contact, and name, and status, and some other stuff. It's doing a select statement, and then that returns one, two, three, four, five, in fact, uh, yeah, five packets coming back. So the time difference between the last packet arriving, so this was um, this was taken actually on the client, but we'll have to use this for our service time for the time being. The last request packet and the only request packet flows at this point here, and then we see a response. So you can see that aside from uh, whatever network delay I might have, service time appears to be around 539 milliseconds. For that particular query and then we have the accumulation of the time spent here 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 and here if we add all of that lot up that gives us the spread the response spread there is no request spread because we only had had one packet and if we measure the time from there all the way down to there we'd get the total response time from a client perspective so I hope that gives you some idea of what you can do with network tracing and just a few simple concepts.